In this video, I'm going to show how to clone an existing GitHub project into Visual Studio and then debug through that project. And in doing so, we're going to learn a little bit about how to create a simple application with the C-Sharp Razor page where we can create JSON and we can collect data from the user. Now, why is this important? Well, one thing I always recommend to a developer who's starting a new job is to be self-sufficient and to learn the source code as quickly as possible. And the best way to do that is to clone a GitHub repository, which you'll find is fairly ubiquitous in development today, and then set a breakpoint. Walk through the program with the debugger and then learn it. And then when you have questions, go to a subject matter expert, maybe a principal developer or a tech lead, and ask those very specific questions. I'm comfortable that you'll find you'll have much better success by doing that than going to someone and saying, how does it work? It will also help you in this class because every time I create a video, I push a commit to GitHub so you can see exactly the source code that I did for that video in one concise commit. For example, I'll go to a previous semester and if we take a look at 23 commits, we have things like add a few variables, consume output in JSON data, add validation to the schema, so on and so forth. And if you click on one of these commits, you can see exactly what I added. And here again, it lines up very nicely to the video where I actually created that. So let's get started. And I'm going to show a demo application that we've seen before. And this is the application where we introduce ourselves to each other. So I have a little bit of data in there already. Let me go ahead and add another row. So Control Shift V, uh, Control Shift C is the format painter in Microsoft Word and things like that, where it just copies the, the formatting of a font and then you can paste it over another font and apply that formatting. Now I'm going to hit Submit. So you notice here we have a form that we're filling out and then we have results that we see below for that form. Now, if I go to JSON feed, we'll see that it produces that same data we were just looking at in a JSON format. This is the repository for that roster tool we were looking at just a moment ago. And it is a public repository, so you're welcome to clone this as well and follow along. As a matter of fact, I'd recommend that. First, let's go to code. And down here, you see a couple of options. I'm going to use HTTPS, and I'm going to click this button which will copy my GitHub URL. In Visual Studio, I'll choose Git and then Clone Repository. Choose Control V to paste and notice it's going to put it into a new folder and I choose Clone. Uh, okay, sure, we'll go ahead and save. I happen to have a project already open. I'm gonna save that, but that doesn't matter. You could do this from just a fresh Visual Studio if you want. Now it's cloning. And if we compare our project on GitHub, we see things like pages and then index.cshtml, index.cshtml, CS. And that maps very closely to what we now have on our local computer. So we see we can go to pages and we can go to index.cshtml. Now notice there's a twisty here and there's index.cshtml.cs. Now what's the difference? Well, index.cshtml it looks like a mix of a little bit of C sharp as we see up here and down here and it's embedded within HTML. So this is essentially our view where the cshtml.cs file is like a code behind. It's something that handles events and it can talk to things that are behind the wall, behind the curtain, things like our database, uh, things like a JSON feed, things like that. So the CS file is pure C sharp where the CSHTML file is a mix of HTML and C Sharp put together. Now, how do they join together? Well, take a look up here. In this block that starts with an at symbol and then open close curly, we see there's something here called view data shortcut list. And we will see more on view data in just a moment. But suffice it to say that that's our list of shortcuts. And you notice it's saving it into a local variable called shortcuts. Now, when I mouse over this, we can scroll down here and we see that same variable called shortcuts again. And this time it's within a for each loop. So it's an iteration. It's iterating over those shortcuts and it is printing out the results in this table view here. So first name, last name, keyboard shortcut and what do. And you see that we have our header at the top that has all of those column names. In other words, that is rendering this that we see right here, the repeating data table. 
So, okay, where does shortcut list come from? If we look at the code behind, we'll see that there's an on get function or method if you prefer, and it is initializing this shortcut list to shortcut roster dot all shortcuts. So this is taking those shortcuts and exposing them to our view. Okay, then what shortcut roster? Well, I can control click on that and that will take us to a the the class called shortcut roster. That's a good trick in Visual Studio. If you're on a type that's like a class type, control click to go right to that class. So shortcut roster is a special kind of class. It is a static class. And that means we don't need to make objects out of it. All of the values are specific to that class without a specific object. Now you notice here that it has a list of shortcuts in Git or Setter that we're setting up here. So this essentially acts as an in-memory representation of all those shortcuts, and that can be used across several pages in our application. As a matter of fact, we've already seen that because we saw the JSON feed and the UI look and feel both together, both fed by this exact same data source. In memory, we could use a database, which in the long term might be a good idea, but for our purposes, in memory is just fine. And also, guess what? Uh, that reduces our cost on Azure. As a matter of fact, I've had this hosted now for three years and I've not had to pay for it because I'm just using in memory. Once we get to persistence, then we have to start thinking about how much it's going to cost. So nonetheless, let's go back to our index.cshtml, and I already set a breakpoint in the on get. I did so just by kind of clicking over here in the left. I'm going to do so on the on post as well. Now remember the difference between on get and on post. They're both HTTP actions. Delete, put, options, trace, those are a few others where get and post are the most common. Get tends to be a read-only operation where post tends to be we are creating something or we are updating something. So I've set breakpoints in both so we can watch how they behave and then, most importantly, we can follow along as they're doing their work. So where the first web page we saw was hosted on Azure, we also have the opportunity to simply bring this up locally. So I choose the IIS Express, and let's give it just a moment to render a page for us. The page is starting to render. Now, I urge caution here on this port. It tends to randomly assign a port number. So... Uh, that port number will likely change the next time you deploy it, and it will also change if you deploy it to Azure or anything like that. So don't hard code that port number. Uh, now, notice when it starts up, we get some interesting behavior because the page is hourglassing, but if we take a look over in Visual Studio, we'll see that our breakpoint is now yellow, which means it's sitting and it's waiting for us to tell it to proceed. And the nice thing about this is that we can tell it to proceed at our own pace. So let's go to debug and let's remember a few shortcuts here. So continue means I'm all finished debugging. I uh, just keep running the program. That's F5. Step over is F10, which means execute this line and move to the next. Step into is F11, which means if I'm on a method call, step into that method. One thing I'll warn you about. Number one, it's a good idea to memorize these shortcut keys because you'll find you'll hit them quite a bit. But number two, this is the caution. If you look at Eclipse, Visual Studio, IntelliJ, the major IDEs, they are not standard on shortcut keys. And what is the step over key in one is the continue key in another. So it's really easy to get deep down into something and get right where you need to be and then just as force of habit, accidentally hit the wrong key. I do this all the time because I use all three of those development environments many times in the same day and I'll forget what I'm doing because I'm just looking at code. So uh, memorize those, those shortcuts for debugging, but also make sure you're in the right development environment. Now, in this case, I don't really have anything to step into here. Uh, so really, I can just go ahead and tell it to continue because right now that roster is empty. So there's really nothing for me to look at. And if we come over here, sure enough, we see, okay, uh, there's nothing in that roster. What we want to do now is put data in there and watch that happen. I've entered some data into the form and just kind of make note of this. So Brandon Jones, Control Shift T, Reopen Close Tab, and then I choose Submit. Uh, it takes me back to Visual Studio. And now, once again, we see that our debugger breakpoint line has lit up yellow, which means it's waiting for us. So F10 steps over. F10 again steps to the next line. 
Now, I don't have a method call here for a method that I wrote, so I can't choose F11, which is the step into. But perhaps we'll get another opportunity to do that in a bit. Let's go ahead and choose F5 uh, to tell this to continue. And sure enough, there we see Brandon Jones, Control Shift T, uh, reopen closed tabs. Uh, we'll add one more shortcut here, Betty. So Betty White, Control W, Chrome, close the tab, I choose Submit. And once again, we're going to see that the breakpoint hits. But what I want to take a look at in a little more depth here is the variables. Because notice that I can mouse over this and I can inspect the variables. So I have Betty, Control W, uh, White, Chrome, Close Tab. I could change this to close the current tab. And notice this is a really nice thing about the debugger is number one, we can see the value of variables, and number two, we can change those values while we're debugging and look at the result, and that's a good way to do what-if analysis. So remember, it used to say close a tab. Now it says close the current tab. Now what happens when I choose F5? What do we actually see on the web page? We see close the current tab. So debugger, you can see the value of variables and you can change the value of variables. A lot of really handy things that we can do when we're trying to learn a program. One neat thing, and I think often not used a lot, is this uh, step backward option as well, where if you've gone too far, you can actually go back and see what used to be there as well. So, so that's a good look at the debugger, and we know that this shortcut variable contains whatever the user entered on that form. But how did it get into that shortcut variable? That's the next thing we have to figure out. Let's start by looking at the shortcut variable. And if we scroll up a little bit, we see that it is defined here on line number 18 with what we're going to call a getter and setter method, which means we can use naming conventions to set each of those properties. First name, last name, uh, you know, program or work, so on and so forth, all the stuff in that form. It marries up by naming convention when we have that bind property with the getter and setter option as well. So if we take a look at shortcut, we see first name, last name, keyboard shortcut, what do. And this is a, a class we could call it a POCO, a plain old C sharp object, similar to a POJO on Java, plain old Java object, or a DTO. It is essentially a noun. A noun is a person, place, or thing, and a noun has attributes. And these variables are essentially those attributes. Remember one of these, just pick one. First name, last name, keyboard, shortcut, software, what do. If we go to our CSHTML file, let's take a look at this form up here, which is where I entered that shortcut data, and look at what we have. First name, last name, keyboard, shortcut, software, what do. Then we have a submit button. So when we submit this, it's going to go to our CSHTML CS file, and it's going to say, okay, do I have a bind property variable that has these same attributes defined on it? And sure enough, we do. It's this thing called shortcut. So it just marries up automatically. Now, that's a look at our entry form and the results form. I also want to take a look at our JSON creation. So I'm going to go to Solution Explorer, and I'm going to click on feed.cshtml. And you see that this is an unusually simple page, but let's remember what it looks like. When I click JSON feed, we see JSON. We don't see any HTML. As a matter of fact, if I do control U and look at the source, it is just raw JSON that we're looking at. So the UI is essentially not needed at all. And that's why we just have this stuff here. As a matter of fact, the UI is ignored. But let's take a look behind the scenes at the CS, uh, the code behind file, the CS file. And what we'll find is something very important. Once again, this is ridiculously simple. We see that the onGet method returns JSON result. If we take a look at our index file, onGet returns void. Okay, what's the difference? Void means find the matching CSHTML file and represent that. But JSON result means ignore the CSHTML file. Just take this noun class, this POCO, as I mentioned, or POJO or DTO, take this noun class and automatically make JSON out of it. It is incredibly easy. So if we take a look at feed CSHTML CS, 
we see that's returning a JSON result. And therefore, we're under contract to return a JSON result. To return a JSON result is quite simple. We simply create a JSON result object, as you see here, and we pass into it some type of data class that can be represented as JSON. If we take a look at the data class that we're returning, we are returning shortcut roster dot all shortcuts. Let's take a look at shortcut roster. You might remember this from just a few moments ago. This is our static class. And remember, static means that we don't need to create objects out of it. All of the information belongs to that class directly. What information is that? Well, the information here is a list of all shortcuts. And remember, that list of all shortcuts is what we populated from our index page. So if we take a look at this all po uh, uh, this on post method, remember when we debug through this, what was line number 34? Well, that was a call to our shortcut roster static class and the all shortcut list on that, and then the add function or add method for that all shortcuts list. So here in our user interface form, we're taking data from the user, we're putting it into this shortcut, which is our bind property variable. And then we take that shortcut and we simply add it to a list on a static class. And then within our UI, we make that list available so that it can represent those results. But as an added bonus, because it is a static class and it has this attribute, we can share that same data right over here to our feed CSHTML file and our feed CS file, which gives us that JSON source. So in this video, we've seen how to clone a project from GitHub, snap a breakpoint, and then step through it in the debugger. And in doing so, we've gotten to learn a little bit about how we can create a very simple C Sharp Razor page that collects data from the user, shows data to the user, and in a very easy way, generates a JSON result. As always, I hope this video has been helpful, and I look forward to reading your comments. Thank you.